Thank you for the nice introduction. And I would just like to um, tell you a little bit of what our lab has been uh, doing in this uh, now many years. Uh, so we are very much focused on mitochondria and mitochondrial sources of reactive oxygen species and how we are studying how this impacts on cardiac physiology and disease. So I'm just going to start by saying a few very obvious things about how mitochondria are important for the heart. And this is because the uh, heart is a very energy demanding tissue. So the main uh, role of mitochondria in the heart is to produce ATP through oxidative phosphorylation to sustain cardiac contraction and relaxation. So mitochondria are very abundant in cardiac cells. Uh, they occupy quite a large volume. And they are also uh, very well organized and tightly packed between the myofibrils. Uh, so we have interfibrillar mitochondria. There can also be subsarcolemma mitochondria. But the spatial organization of, uh, and the large uh, volume they are occupying uh, actually ensure that the um, ATP that is produced by, by the mitochondria is uh, efficiently delivered at the site where it's needed to sustain contraction, uh, metabolism, and also ion homeostasis. Uh, in addition to being a major source of ATP, uh, mitochondria uh, also can also act as cytosolic calcium buffer. So for instance, it has been shown, in the, especially in the recent years, how uh, mitochondria can participate in buffering and uptake in cytosolic calcium on a B2B basis. And they also serve as signaling roles. For instance, we've heard uh, they interact with um, a number of organelles within the cell. Just a couple of days ago, we heard about uh, the interaction between mitochondria and ER and initiation of the integrated stress response. But they can also interact with the organelles that are further apart, for instance, by producing reactive oxygen species or other signaling molecules uh, to transmit a signal. So it doesn't come as a surprise that uh, when mitochondria are not functioning properly in the heart, that this has a major outcome and a deleterious effect on cardiac function. In addition to not being an efficient producer of ATP, uh, mitochondria can, when dysfunctional, mitochondria can also become a major source of reactive oxygen species. The reactive oxygen species are signaling molecules as well. We need them also in physiology. However, when produced at exacerbated levels or when there is an imbalance between uh, ROS formation and elimination, we can have oxidative stress. And along with the uh, dysfunction in mitochondria, this is one of the major uh, denominator, common denominators of a number of cardiac uh, complications. Here I'm just listing some of them. So one can imagine that by targeting mitochondria or targeting um, uh, production or elimination of reactive oxygen species, this can represent a possibly an efficient therapeutic tool to treat cardiac diseases. In order to target mitochondrial so or in general sources of ROS, we need to know where um, ROS are being produced. And also in that sense, uh, a number of uh, lab laboratories and a number of studies have already addressed where in the cell exactly ROS are being formed and uh, how this can impact, uh, for example, on the progression and development of uh, cardiovascular diseases. And also here I'm listing just a few of these sources, NADPH oxidase, xanthine oxidase, uncoupled NOS. These are all enzymes that have been shown to contribute to the development of cardiac diseases. Nevertheless, mitochondria are considered to be a major source of ROS within the cell. But also within the mitochondria, it's interesting to know where ROS are being formed. Obviously, the best described site for ROS formation in the mitochondria is the mitochondrial respiratory chain. So as the electrons are being transported across the respiratory chain, uh, they can also escape and pass, partially reduce uh, superoxide to, uh, sorry, oxygen to superoxide. And this special, happens especially at the level of complexes one and three. We can also have the reversal of the uh, electron transport and again, for, as nicely described by Mike Murphy's lab, and again, formation of uh, superoxide at the level of complex one. But there are also other sites uh, within the mitochondria where ROS are being formed. For instance, P66 chic. It's an cytosolic adapter protein that uh, upon stress can translocate to mitochondria. 
and uh, it can steal electrons from cytochrome C and uh, in that way results in the formation of um, uh, H2O2. And then we have also monoamino oxidases. So these are flavoenzymes localized at the outer mitochondrial membrane and they are responsible for uh, catabolism of biogenic amines. So why did we become interested in monoamino oxidases exactly? Well, initially because of this observation that in the brain mitochondria, the steady state formation of H2O2 that is obtained during the monoamino oxidase catalyzed oxidative deamination of tyramine is 48 times higher than the one that is generating during the oxidation of substrates through complex two of the respiratory chain in the presence of antimycin A. And this is a condition in which the respiratory chain is producing the maximal amount of ROS. So we thought that the, uh, actually, MAO is capable of quite a large amount of H2O2 that is being formed. And we asked whether, we wondered whether this could somehow contribute to the uh, progression of the, and development of cardiovascular diseases. So just a brief introduction on uh, MAOs. They exist in two isoforms, A and B. <clears throat> As I mentioned, they are localized at the outer mitochondrial membrane, and they're responsible for the oxidative deamination of catecholamines and neurotransmitters. During this process, they uh, generate products such as aldehydes, ammonia, and H2O2. Uh, monoamine oxidases have been studied quite extensively at the level of the central nervous system. Indeed, a number of inhibitors of MAO has been developed during the years, and they are still being used in the clinic now for the treatment of psychiatric disorders. This is because by blocking MAO activity, one can spare the levels of neurotransmitters that are such as uh, serotonin or dopamine, uh, molecules that are uh, involved, for example, in the development of depression. So this is the, pur the purpose for um, using MAO inhibitors is this one. But not many people, especially at the time when we started uh, looking at this, not many people were looking actually at what could be the role of products of MAO activity rather than substrates and whether um, this enzyme could play a role uh, in the cardiovascular system. So what is thought to occur in physiological conditions in, um, in the, uh, the interface between the sympathetic nerve efferents and uh, extra neuronal cells, in this case, cardiac myocytes, is that uh, MAO substrates are stored in the, um, in the vesicles within the ner uh, sympathetic nerve efferents. Uh, when the neurotransmitters are released, they interact with the adrenergic or dopamine receptors that are located at the sarcolemma of cardiac myocytes. And once this interaction is over, the um, catecholamines are rapidly reuptaken either through the norepinephrine transporter or dopamine transporter and recycled back into the uh, nerve efferents and recycled back into the vesicles. This happens with 92% of the uh, catecholamine that has been uh, released. Only 4% escapes into the circulation and another 4% is then uptaken by the extra neuronal cell, uh, in this case cardiac myocyte, through the extra neuronal monoamine transporter. And once in the cytoplasm, uh, the, the neurotransmitter is degraded immediately by the monoamino oxidases and this obviously results in the formation of H2O2 that presumably in physiological conditions is either serve signaling purposes or is rapidly uh, neutralized by the cellular or mitochondrial anti antioxidant systems. And here I'm just showing a brief um, uh, memo of uh, what happens with the major catecholamines that are uh, MAO substrates such as norepinephrine that following MAO mediated degradation generates the HPG or dopamine that generates an aldehyde intermediate that is, then, that is very reactive and unstable and is immediately converted into the corresponding acid by the aldehyde dehydrogenase 2. So uh, we initially want, considering that um, catecholamine spillover is one of the major hallmarks of heart failure in humans, well, the first question we asked was whether uh, monoamine oxidase could play a role in heart failure. So to answer this question, we used uh, mice that were subjected to pressure overload by transverse aortic constriction, and uh, we, after six weeks of TAC, we looked at those mice we had in parallel groups uh, treated with uh, vehicle or with MAO specific MAO inhibitor chlorgeline. And what we could see is that there was 
as expected in the, in the pressure overloaded mice, we had the increase in uh, end diastolic and end systolic dimension, a decrease in fractional shortening and ejection fraction, but remarkably mice that were um, injected with chlorgeline uh, had uh, basically um, this damage and uh, so LV dilation and the cardiac dysfunction was completely prevented. So to understand uh, what was the reason for this upregulation of MAO activity, we looked at the catecholamine uh, catabolism and we found that uh, indeed levels of norepinephrine were markedly decreased in these failing hearts. And we saw uh, a concomitant increase in DHPG levels, which was the first catabolite of malmediated degradation. So when we looked at the ratio between these two species, we could see that the uh, ratio was uh, significantly upregulated in the failing hearts. But upon MAOA inhibition, uh, this uh, norepinephrine degradation was completely reversed. Uh, this was, uh, as expected, accompanied also by oxidative stress. Uh, so failing hearts show an increase in DHE staining. This is what I'm showing here, but we've also looked at the uh, lipid peroxidation, formation of 4-hydroxinonenal and malondialdehyde. And in all these cases, we see an upregulation in failing hearts, but upon MAO inhibition, this oxidative stress appears to be prevented. And this was nicely accompanied also by a reduction of the number of uh, apoptotic cells in these failing hearts. Um, just to make sure that what we are looking at with the pharmacological inhibition of the enzyme is, all, is really due to the inhibition of MAO and not uh, due to some non-specific effects, uh, we've employed also mutant mice, in this case MAO neomice uh, that are, act as dominant negative and we also subjected them to pressure overload, in this case, uh, to up to nine weeks. And we performed pressure volume loops relationships up to, afterwards. And uh, also in this case, we saw uh, increase in LV chamber dimensions. So volumes were increased both in end systole and then diastole and um, um, cardiac function was uh, uh, decreased in these failing mice, but not in the MAOA mutant mice. Since I've told you that we had two isoforms of MAO, we've also checked whether the other one was doing the same thing and uh, whether it was involved in the development of heart failure. And we, for that, we used MAOB knockout mice. And also in this case, upon pressure low overload, we saw an increase in uh, uh, LV volumes and a decrease in ejection fraction that was uh, almost completely prevented in the mice that were lacking MAOB. So it appears uh, that both isoforms contribute to the development of uh, heart failure in these hearts subjected to hemodynamic stress. And then if we inhibit either of the two isoforms, either genetically or pharmacologically, um, we can prevent oxidative stress. Uh, I didn't show you there is also a reduction in fibrosis and ECM remodeling, uh, reduction in cell death, and consequently uh, the function of uh, the left ventricle is improved. Um, so we've established, and we knew it also before, that mitochondria are a major source of ROS, and apparently MAOs also contribute to this ROS formation. But mitochondria can also be a target. In fact, there are several components, for instance, of the respiratory chain, complexes 1, 2, and 3, that can be oxidized and are target of ROS. And this, in turn, exacerbates further the formation of superoxide from the respiratory chain. Mitochondrial DNA is very susceptible to oxidation. Uh, ATP synthase can also be oxidized. PTP uh, is uh, more prone to open in conditions of oxidative stress. So the question that came kind of naturally was whether malactivity can directly target mitochondria to affect mitochondrial function. So firstly, we looked at the, whether ROS are actually being formed in the mitochondria. Since MAO is at the outer mitochondrial membrane here, we employed the genetically encoded um, uh, H2O2 sensitive probe called HYPER that we can target either to mitochondria or to the cytosol. And uh, when we used these two probes and stimulated uh, MAO activity, in this case with dopamine, uh, we, see, we saw a rapid increase in uh, 
the hyper ratio uh, in the mitochondrial compartment compared to the cytosol, which occurred only uh, after quite a long delay. And when we quantify this, we see uh, that indeed in the mitochondria, the H2 2 formation is increased upon MAO activity stimulation. And uh, if we block the enzyme, we can obviously prevent this increase. So now we wanted to see, okay, if we stimulate MAO activity by giving, uh, feeding the substrates, can we see uh, a difference in mitochondrial function? So here we looked at mitochondrial membrane potential using TMRM. And we were a bit disappointed to see that if we give dopamine to the cells, we don't actually see any change. Obviously, this can happen because these are normal cells. So it could be that uh, activation of MAO in this condition does not do anything, or we hypothesize that there could be also a latent mitochondrial dysfunction. So what can happen is that, so normally what happens is that when electrons are being transferred across the respiratory chain, this electron transport is coupled to the pumping of the protons uh, from the matrix into the intermembrane space at the level of complexes one, three, and four. This generates a proton gradient that is then used by the ATP synthase uh, to drive the synthesis of ATP. In case there is a problem at the level of the respiratory chain and this proton pumping is not, there is no more proton gradient being generated by the complexes, ATP synthase can start working in reverse, hydrolyzing glyco glycolytically synthesized ATP and uh, thereby extruding the protons out of the matrix into the intermembrane space uh, to maintain the membrane potential. So if we use oligomycin, for instance, it's an inhibitor of ATP synthase, uh, we can block this process, uh, the reversal of this process. And in case there is a problem at the level of the respiratory chain, we would see an immediate drop in mitochondrial membrane potential. So we went back to our experiments. Here I'm showing you uh, wild type and MAOB uh, knockout adult cardiac myocytes loaded with TMRM. So as I've shown you before, if we give only dopamine, nothing happens. If we give only oligomycin, nothing happens again. But if we give a combination of dopamine and oligomycin, after 20 minutes of incubation, we already start seeing uh, individual mitochondria that start to be depolarized in the wild type cells. After 45 minutes, uh, the, uh, the loss in mitochondrial membrane potential in wild type, wild type cells is complete, but this does not happen in MAOB knockout cells. And uh, here at the end, we just give FCCP to confirm that this uh, fluorescence is due to, indeed due to the mitochondrial membrane potential. And this is quantified here. So this happens in uh, healthy, normal cardiac myocytes, but we wanted to see whether um, MAO is also relevant in other situations, for example, in diabetes. Diabetes is characterized by mitochondrial dysfunction and uh, oxidative stress. So uh, here we used uh, high we used uh, uh, cardiac myocytes exposed either to high glucose or uh, to a combination of high glucose and pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-1 beta to better mimic what actually happens uh, in vivo because diabetes is characterized by a very strong inflammatory component. So also in this case, uh, we uh, transfect cells with this uh, mitochondrial hyper to measure H2O2. If we give uh, high glucose to these cells, we see an increase in mitochondrial ROS formation. This is even uh, further enhanced if we give a combination of high glucose and IL-1 beta. And remarkably, when we block MAO activity, in this case with pargelin, this increase is, uh, does not happen. So the increase in mitoros formation is uh, not there. We've also, again, tested this by using a genetic approach. So here we silenced MAOA uh, expression. We get approximately 70% reduction in the enzyme expression. And also in, with siRNA against MAOA, we do not see an increase in mitoros formation upon high glucose or IL-1 beta exposure. Again, we looked at the mito mitochondrial function. So uh, with high glucose, we see that mitochondria already start losing membrane potential. And this is even further exacerbated with the combination of high glucose and IL-1 beta. And uh, with pargelin, this did not happen. Again, suggesting that also in this setting, uh, ROS produced by MAO can, uh, uh, can target mito mitochondria to induce mitochondrial function. 
So the question was how, uh, what is the target within the mitochondria? So we hypothesized that it could be respiratory chain that might get oxidized, one of the complexes that might get oxidized and impair mitochondrial respiration. So we looked at mitochondrial respiration in all these groups, but we actually did not observe any difference. So it appeared that uh, mitochondria were respiring quite well, regardless of the high glucose or uh, IL-1 beta. We then hypothesized that the other um, target of ROS could be the permeability transition pore and that by uh, uh, that the ROS produced by MAO could actually uh, increase the propensity of the permeability transition pore to open. So we tested this, we went back to the TMRM experiment and this is exactly what I've shown you before. We see a drop in membrane potential with either high glucose or high glucose and IL-1 beta. But if we treat cells with the CSA, the PTP desensitizer CSA, this drop in membrane potential is completely prevented. This suggests that in fact, uh, MAO dependent ROS are actually targeting the PTP and uh, uh, promote the opening of the PTP. Um, we've also wanted to see whether any of this holds true in vivo. So we've injected mice with streptozotocin for 12 weeks. Uh, and after 12 weeks of hyperglycemia, we looked uh, at their cardiac function. So the ejection fraction was not affected in those mice, uh, diabetic or diabetic treated with pargelin. But what we did see was an increase in diastolic stiffness, which suggests that there was diastolic dysfunction in these mice. And this was partially, but significantly uh, prevented by um, MAO inhibition. Uh, again, as expected, we saw an increase in oxidative stress and lipid peroxidation that was prevented by pargelin. And uh, another uh, hallmark of uh, diabetic hearts is also an increase in ER stress. So we looked at the uh, uh, markers of ER stress such as ATF4 and GAT34 that were both uh, significantly upregulated in these diabetic hearts, but upon MAO inhibition, this was uh, uh, re reduced. So the, finally, uh, we've also looked at anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity because, um, for instance, doxorubicin is very toxic for the heart and it accumulates into the, in the mitochondria and indu induces mitochondrial dysfunction and ROS formation. So this was another setting in which we wanted to look at whether MAO could contribute to this deleterious process. So uh, when we gave uh, doxorubicin to these uh, cardiac myocytes, we saw again an increase in mito uh, H2O2 formation that could be even further exacerbated if we, com if we combined doxorubicin with uh, H2O2 just to increase, uh, as it's likely to be in vivo, uh, there are other factors that contribute to the toxicity. And in all these cases, we could see a reduction in the uh, ROS formation in the mitochondria with uh, uh, pargelin. Also with siRNA, we see the same thing, that we can block this ROS formation, suggesting that the effect of the pharmacological inhibitor is specific. Um, this increase in ROS formation uh, was also being reflected at the uh, ratio between oxidized and uh, uh, reduced glutathione within the mitochondria. We measured this with this uh, sensor, MitoGRX1, and uh, also in this case, if we reduce these ROS that are being generated in the mitochondria, we can also improve the uh, ratio between uh, reduced and oxidized glutathione. And uh, finally, uh, mitochondrial function was also impaired. There was a loss of membrane potential with doxorubicin that could be prevented uh, by uh, pargelin. Doxorubicin uh, is also known to impair uh, calcium homeostasis in cardiac myocytes. So we also took a look at that and at the SR calcium load. And we did see that the, uh, cal these are spontaneous calcium transients in neonatal cardiac myocytes. We do see that the frequency was uh, increased uh, and this could be restored by uh, pargelin. We did not see actually a significant difference in amplitude but we did see that the uh, SR calcium load was reduced in the doxorubicin-treated um, cardiac myocytes after uh, caffeine stimulation, and that could be again restored by uh, MAO inhibition. 
So last thing uh, uh, is that uh, we also went in vivo. Also in this case, we injected mice with oxorubicin and after five weeks, we looked at cardiac function and saw that it was impaired. There was dilation, there was impairment in function and uh, mice that were treated concomitantly with doxorubicin and MAO inhibitor pargillin were protected from uh, cardiac damage. So just to go back to this initial slide that I've started from, in pathological conditions in, where, in which there is a neurohumoral overdrive, there is an increase in uh, catecholamine spillover, uh, norepinephrine transporter or dopamine transporter activity is reduced. And this is something that has been shown also uh, to occur in patients in addition to experimental models. And another thing that has been proven is that the extra neuronal uptake of catecholamines is doubled in heart failure patients. So we have more catecholamines, more MAO substrates that are coming into the cardiac myocytes. We have higher formation of H2O2. This in turn can target mitochondria. On one hand, this ROS and other species likely that are being formed can target uh, metalloproteinases, mass, I didn't show you this, but in diabetes we also see that mass cell degranulation is increased uh, in those conditions and this promotes the extracellular matrix remodeling and fibrosis development. And on the other hand, we have uh, ear stress, contractile protein oxidation, impairment in cardiac uh, homeostasis, in, sorry, calcium homeostasis, and so on. But importantly, uh, this ROS uh, also exacerbates the function of mitochondria. There can be opening of the, to induce the opening of the permeability transition pore, release of cytochrome C, and this then promotes the cell death cascade. So now that I've told you that uh, MAO is very bad and we need to block it, uh, this is true in pathological conditions. Uh, so probably when there is um, an initial signal or initial stress, the activation of MAO becomes deleterious, as uh, I hope I have convinced you at least a little bit in different models of, car of heart failure. However, we know that ROS are also beneficial molecules. We cannot just uh, indiscriminately scavenge all the ROS because this is not good. We need ROS for signaling and um, ROS can also be protective. So uh, we, know, we know that a certain level of ROS, uh, a moderate amount of ROS actually extends lifespan. And uh, we also know that there is um, this kind of hormetic response by which this has also been nicely shown in a paper by uh, Fabio De Liza, Thomas Krieg, and Mike Murphy last year, where they've used the mitoparaquat, which is a mitochondria-targeted compound that generates ROS in the mitochondria. So low amount of this compound delivered to mitochondria generates low amount of ROS that is actually protective against uh, uh, anoxia reoxygenation injury or ischemia reperfusion injury in vivo. This is uh, the, the fact that it's ROS that are being protective is shown by the fact that if you scavenge ROS with, for example, general antioxidants such as MPG, uh, this uh, beneficial effect, protective effect of mitoparaquat is um, abolished. So a certain low amount of ROS can protect the heart. Uh, ROS can serve signaling roles. They're also important, for instance, in stem cell to maintain uh, to maintain uh, stemness of uh, stem cells. They're important for differentiation, uh, organogenesis, and set, et cetera. So we wondered whether, in addition to being very bad in pathological conditions, uh, ROS produced by uh, MAOs can also have a physiological role. And to test this, we, uh, we've used this model of uh, cardiac myocytes differentiation from iPS cells, and we wondered whether uh, MAOs could play a role there. It is no secret that ROS are necessary and required for proper cardiomyocyte differentiation. This has already been shown, but we wanted to see whether also MAOs could have a role in this process. So we started by looking at the relative expression of the two isoforms in the iPS cells and during the process of differentiation. And we saw that this is day zero. Uh, which are actually iPS cells that are then being pushed through the differentiation up to the day 20 when we have beating cardiac myocytes. So we do see that uh, iPS cells express MAOA, but not MAOB. 
And this expression of MAOA actually increases progressively throughout the differentiation process and peaks when we have the population of beating cardiac myocytes. On the other hand, MAOB is not expressed either in IPS or uh, when beating cardiac myocytes are formed, but it, turn, it comes up uh, uh, much later when we keep uh, cardiac myocytes in culture for over 40 days, so when they become more mature. And this is the, actually another block just showing that after 40 days of culture, we have actually a reduction of MAOA and the uh, appearance of MAOB. And this is some a situation that quite faithfully reflects what happens in the adult human heart, where we have both isoforms of the enzyme. Considering that in the IPS cells, we only have uh, MAOA, we went on and used CRISPR-Cas9 to knock it out and uh, then to test whether this can actually have an impact on cardiomyocyte differentiation. So here I'm just showing that we were able to fully delete the protein either in the IPS. Uh, this was maintained obviously also in the uh, cardiomyocytes derived from this IPS. And we did not get a compensatory upregulation of the other isoform MAOB. So when we push these cells, uh, two lines, uh, wild types and knockouts through the differentiation, we do get, uh, both, we get both of them to, di to differentiate into cardiomyocytes. Uh, the difference is that while wild types have uh, nicely organized sarcomeres, uh, this, uh, maybe you cannot see very well, the images are quite small, but the sarcomeres are really nicely organized uh, in a striated pattern. This is not the case with the myocytes that differentiate from the uh, MAOA knockout cells. We've looked at some of the pro structural proteins of the heart, uh, important for the heart, and we've seen that there is a down regulation of the uh, myosin heavy chain 6, uh, uh, while 7 was not affected. We saw an upregulation in GATA4 that could be an indicator of uh, dysfunctional cardiac myocytes. Uh, we then looked also from the functional point of view and measured calcium transients and response to caffeine. And indeed, we saw that this was dramatically decreased in these cells that are lacking MAOA and uh, the SR load was reduced as well. Um, again, since uh, MAOA generates ROS, we looked at whether ROS levels were different and whether it was different during different stages of differentiation. So here in blue are uh, blue bars that represent the wild type cardiac myocytes. And I think you can easily appreciate that there is a slight increase uh, uh, in RO mitochondrial ROS formation in each stage of differentiation. On the other hand, in the, and this peaks uh, when cardiac myocytes are formed. Um, in, on the other hand, in the MAOA knockout cells, there is a dramatic downregulation in the mitoros levels. This does not really change throughout the different stages of differentiation, but it does increase when cardiac myocytes are formed, suggesting that in this stage, the ROS that are being formed are not produced by MAO, but by some other source. In these conditions, we did not observe any changes in mitochondrial uh, membrane potential, so it appears that mitochondrial function is intact. To see whether any of the signaling pathways could be um, affected by this different ROS formation, we looked at the phosphorylation of AKT and GSK3 beta and uh, P38 in this uh, at different stages, at the early stages of differentiation. So before we have uh, beating cardiac myocytes and when, uh, when we have actually the specification of the lineage towards cardiomyocyte formation. And we did see it, so at day two, we do not see any difference. Sorry, these graphs are a little bit small, but I hope you can appreciate that at day four, we have a down regulation in phosphorylation of AKT and GSK3 beta with no change in P38. This is also accompanied by a reduction in uh, WINT expression. We do see a reduction in WINT3, WINT3A, and WINT11. And also we do see a reduction in the expression of NKX2.5 and MESP1 uh, transcription factors that are quite important for car uh, cardiomyocyte structure. So um, to see whether 
if we rescue, if we re-express the protein, whether we can rescue this uh, impairment in signaling, uh, we've tried an approach using the siRNA. So we wanted to avoid expressing the protein uh, and getting an overexpression effect because we know that this would be bad. So we took advantage of SR, siRNA because we do know that the, the effect of siRNA is transient. So here, this is a little bit complicated and I try to explain it the best I can. So when we uh, administer siRNA uh, for MAOA, we do see a reduction that lasts for approximately two days. And by day four, normally it is, um, uh, the protein is re-expressed. So this is indicated by, by this one P, which means one pulse of siRNA. So by day four, we do get, uh, if we give siRNA for MAO A uh, at day zero, by day four, we do have the expression of protein that is actually similar to the one that we, the levels are similar to the ones that we see in scramble RNA treated cells. However, if we do give two pulses, so if we give one pulse at day zero and another one at day two, we, do, we, we can maintain this uh, down regulation, reduction in the MAOA expression. And this is shown here, we get approximately 50 to 60% reduction in the protein, whereas with the one pulse of siRNA, we get re-expression. And we do see that uh, phosphorylation of the AKT and the GSK3 beta uh, in these cells is slightly but significantly rescued when uh, we have re-expression of MAOA. Importantly, we also do get uh, ROS to come back up, not completely, but partially. And also uh, Win3, expression of Win3A and NKX2.5 is also partially rescued by this re-expression of MAOA. Last slide, just to show you that this, is, this happens also at the functional level and structural as well. So the sarcomere organization, which similarly to what we see in the knockout, also with the siRNA, we do see that it's, um, the sarcomeres are disorganized and misaligned, but this is rescued by the, uh, by the re-expression of the enzyme and also calcium uh, cycling and uh, homeostasis, not completely because uh, the calcium transients are still different from the uh, scramble RNA treated cells but we do get a partial rescue also of the calcium homeostasis and uh, SR calcium load. So just to summarize this last part, we do see that the deletion of MAOA uh, induces morphological and functional changes in IPS-derived cardiac myocytes. And this happens early on during the process of uh, differentiation. So between days two and four, it appears that uh, ROS produced by Mao are important for the activation of these signaling pathways that are crucial for lineage specification and cardiomyogenesis. So while in the, again, in the take home message, uh, the overall take home message is that while in the pathological conditions, MAO activity is deleterious and contributes to cardiac dysfunction, it still does have a signaling role in physiological conditions and um, it is required for at least for the process of differentiation of cardiac myocytes. Last uh, thing I want to do is to thank the people that have contributed to generate all this data. So Salvatore Antonucci for the uh, doxorubicin results and mitoparaquat studies together with Pet Roberta Menabo and uh, Andrea Carpi who, is, uh, who left the lab. Sony Deshwal, who also left the lab, she developed the project on diabetes, and Moises Di Sante, who is an expert on IPS and cardiomyocyte differentiation, and he completely performed the last part that I have shown you. And of course, I thank Fabio Di Lisa for his constant support and all the collaborators, and I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Nina. Um, we've got a number of questions, but just to get you going, I'll that um, you're thinking about questions by asking you a couple, perhaps. Um, so when you inhibit monoamine oxidase, it's protective, um, stops the development of heart failure. Um, I guess, um, if I understand correctly, you would expect um, monoamines like adrenaline, noradrenaline to increase. Um, yeah. And, of course, they normally do bad things. You know, beta blockers are protective. Um, um, so how do you reconcile the two? 
Uh, so, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it is true that indiscriminate increase in the uh, catecholamine levels would be deleterious. However, I think the, the site for, um, so the storage of catecholamines is important. So not only blocking degradation and increasing the levels, but those catecholamines that are not being degraded need to be restored into the vesicles. So another thing that uh, accompanies, uh, and honestly, I do not have an explanation for this, uh, when we block MAOI, for example, in a heart failure model, where I show that there is um, um, less degradation of norepinephrine, in that setting, we also see that norepinephrine transporter expression, which is reduced in failing hearts, increases. I do not know why and how, honestly, but this would suggest that the transporter is again functioning properly, so it can recycle, so it can transport the catecholamines back into the nerve terminals and they can probably there be recycled and restored into vesicles. So only the fraction that is being released in that case is the one that can overstimulate the energy receptors and so on. Okay. And the second question is um, in your experiments where you add you have the hyperprobe, so you're measuring hydrogen peroxide production, and you put on some monoamines, tyramine or something like this, yes. yeah, to generate a peroxide signal. What concentration of tyramine or monoamine do you have to add to generate a signal? So, you know, probably in your probably in your blood you have nanomolar amounts, tens of nanomolar. Yes, can you see true. a signal? Would can you see a signal with ten nanomolar? I do not remember trying 10 nanomolar. I, uh, the concentration that I used in the experiments that I've shown you is one micromolar, which is a lot, I recognize, compared to what do we get in the, in the, in, in the, in the human body. So this is probably not something that the enzyme would see in vivo. Um, honestly, I don't remember. These are experiments I did many years ago. I do not remember. Yeah. If it may, it may be the hyperprobe that's not sensitive enough. You know, it's happening, but you just can't see yes. it. So, yeah. yes. Okay. yes, that's true. Yes. Okay, so as we discussed earlier, I think it's just easier for you to start at the top of these questions. Maybe okay. 20 of them. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's easier to read them. Sometimes it's just easier to give the answer and, you know, yes. whatever you think's best. So we have the first question that I see at least from Kutuba Karwi. He uh, asks uh, whether is Ma where is Mao uh, most abundant in the heart? Is it in the atrium or in the ventricle? It is expressed in both compartments. So, so uh, in our work, we have uh, focused on MAOs in the left ventricle specifically, where um, uh, MAO is expressed. Uh, in the atria, uh, there is a very nice uh, study performed in patients uh, showing that uh, post-operative uh, fibrilla atrial fibrillation is uh, actually, that MAO, increased MAO activity uh, is um, a predictor of the uh, post-operative atrial fibrillation and that MAO activity is quite pronounced uh, in the atria, at least of, of those patients. It's one of the enzymes that is producing the most ROS in, those, in that situation. So I think it's relevant in both. The second question is by an anonymous attendee asking, do you think uh, renalase, which is sometimes still known as MAOC, has a role in uh, ROS-induced cardiac injury? I'm not sure. I mean, we've never looked at that. I'm not sure if renalase is expressed in the heart, uh, but I guess since you are asking, it is. Uh, we have uh, never looked at that. Gabriele Schiattarella, uh, any epidemiological evidence on the use of clinically improved uh, MAO inhibitors on cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular outcomes? Is the therapeutic dose of MAO inhibitors used in depression effective to inhibit cardiac MAOs? This is a great question and uh, a million dollar question that I would really like to have answer to. Uh, we get asked this quite a lot and honestly, uh, we did not look at that. Uh, so I'm also launching a request here. If any of you has uh, access to patient data, clinical data, and would like to help us see whether 
patients receiving MAO inhibitors uh, have shown any improvements and uh, less incidence in cardiovascular disease, uh, I would really be thrilled to know that. So uh, I am, it's a great question, but I really don't know yet. Um, Michael Shattuck, two questions sort of related. So one, we know neural innervation of the ventricle is heterogeneous with more sympathetic neurons at the apex than the base and also transmural gradient. Does that give you regional heterogeneous injury via this mechanism in heart failure? Hmm. I don't know. That's another thing that we have never looked at. We've usually looked at the whole, I mean, the left ventricle in general, but uh, I've never looked whether there is um, uh, regional heterogeneity, heterogeneity. It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, I might look at that, actually. Related, does the mechanism play a role in acute uh, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy and apical hyperkinesis following excess sympathetic stimulation? I don't think anybody has actually looked at uh, MAOs in relation to Takotsubo, but it's likely. I think that these uh, situations in which there is a, a neurohumeral overdrive is kind of uh, universal, so I would, my guess would be yes. Uh, Thomas Pulinil Kunil, uh, serotonin induced hypertrophy is promoted by MAOA deletion. Yes. However, your studies show that MAO inhibition protects TAC induced mitochondrial dysfunction. Could you comment on this point? Also, in your mice uh, with the MAO deletion, do uh, serotonin levels change? Yes. So, uh, the paper you are referring to. Uh, it's true that it's slightly contrary to what I've shown you. Uh, we've used different um, genetic models. So the group uh, by Dino Parini and Jean Miele Perez that published that paper, they've used uh, uh, differently made uh, MAOA knockout mice. And uh, that mouse already had quite a lot of to start with. So uh, cardiac function was altered already at baseline. And this is a problem with um, uh, global and um, constitutive MAOA knockouts. So uh, obviously, these mice show um, an increase in uh, circulating catecholamine levels, increase in serotonin, and so on. So um, I do not think, that, I mean, we've used them as well, so uh, not, it's not a critique to the, uh, to the other group. We've also used them as a proof of concept to show that actually when there is damage, blocking, uh, lack of MAO can actually protect the heart. But I think that the right way to go would be either to use pharmacological inhibitors that now we do know are quite specific or um, uh, tissue specific, let's say, cardiomyocyte specific uh, induced so, um, yeah, it's a very nice observation, but, um, yeah, uh, I think it's a matter of uh, genetic model, the different genetic models that are being used between us and uh, the other paper. Julieta Palomek, uh, which would be the link between the MAO and high glucose induced uh, ROS production? Uh, that's a very nice question. Uh, so we have a suspicion that uh, either there is cross, I mean, we don't have a definitive proof, but we think there is, so high glucose is known to activate also other uh, ROS sources uh, within the cell, for instance, NOx. So we do think that there might be crosstalk between different sources of ROS and they, they might interact so that they're an initial uh, ROS trigger by one of the sources can then um, propagate and, uh, um, let's say, um, amplify the oxidative uh, signal, uh, also triggering other ROS sources. So this is one thing. Another thing is that we think that in this, um, in addition to catecholamines and other uh, the known substrates that are being stored in uh, nerve terminals, we do think that Stress, uh, there might be other substrates possibly not identified yet that have been stored in the cardiac myocytes, and that um, in conditions of stress, those substrates could be released and thereby trigger uh, MAO activity. But this is a hypothesis. I have to be honest that I do not have data to prove that. Uh, how did you measure the diastolic stiffness? Uh, we used pressure volume, volume loop relationships uh, to measure diastolic function. Sorry. Um, 
uh, anonymous attendee, uh, could you please describe the fibrosis extent of the streptozotocin samples? Thanks. Um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, we measured interstitial fibrosis uh, in those uh, mice. I think there was a threefold increase. I would say up to overall less than 1%. I think it was 0.8% uh, uh, fibrotic tissue, uh, normalized to total, obviously, in the um, streptozotocin treated mice. Um, I'm not sure if I understood well the, the question. What do you mean by fibrosis extent? Uh, so I'm, I'm, as, I'm understanding this, that is there a change then in, in a pargoline? Yes, there is a change, yes. So, yes. so the thing that I did not show and I just briefly mentioned in the diabetic model is that we did see that in um, this STZ treated mice, there is an increase in uh, mast cell degranulation. Mast cells contain a lot of pro-fibrotic and pro-inflammatory factors, and they have been shown also to be able to induce tissue um, extracellular uh, matrix remodeling and fibrosis. So what we found is that this impact happens also in our streptozotocin treated mice, Whereas with pargillin, we can block this. Um, uh, I mean, it's the um, mast cell degranulation is reduced and consequently levels of fibrosis are reduced. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Rosanna ba Rosanna Bassani, uh, I was wondering on the mice with mild deletion, how is their lifespan? I think it continues with the positive. Yeah, and tolerance to exercise. So exercise, nobody has looked at. Uh, lifespan is the same. So uh, the mice that uh, have MAO deletion uh, are quite aggressive, the ones that have MAOA deletion. They do have a lot of catecholamine circulating around, so this is certainly not a fantastic thing. They, uh, what I have also seen is that uh, already at baseline, and this is why at some point we abandoned the genetic model and we focus more on the pharmacological inhibitors, Already at baseline, uh, the, both MAOA and B have slightly depressed contractility. These are global knockout mice and constitutive, okay? Um, so uh, they do already have a slightly depressed contractility, but then upon stress, they react better. Uh, so the lifespan is the same. We did not observe any difference and uh, exercise we've never looked at. And I think- did, also did you age them? Uh, yeah, we didn't, but I think there are other groups that have done that, yeah, yeah. we didn't, yeah. But the, actually, we did not develop these mice, so the um, uh, lab by Jean Shi, uh, she is at the University of Southern, Southern California, she developed those mice and they've characterized them initially, and they've also aged them uh, to see whether lifespan was the same. Um, so, Danuta uh, Cordery, uh, do you see any evidence for dox induced dilated cardiomyopathy? So, yes, we did uh, uh, doxorubicin induced uh, in vivo model as well. We do see that the hearts get dilated uh, after five weeks of so doxorubicin injection, and with MAO inhibition, this dilation is prevented and cardiac function is prevented. Julieta, again, in the MAO inhibited animals, how do they respond to stress like exercise? I don't know, uh, we did not try the exercise, but to stress like uh, pathological stress, they respond better, but uh, exercise we never looked at. Uh, Professor Techmeyer, uh, could you say a word on uncoupling proteins, MAO and ROS formation? Um, uh, uncoupling proteins, I have never looked in this, uh, looked, tested whether they are altered in these conditions uh, in which we either block or stimulate MAO activity. Um, I do not know whether they might have a part in the increase in ROS formation that we are seeing. I'm not sure, but thank you for the suggestion. I will check. Um, Delphine Mika, uh, did you perform the same experiments on iPS cells derived from patients with MAO mutations? Uh, no, we did not, but it's a very nice idea. Thank you. We did not do that so far. Uh, Vibarani, how does monoamino oxidase A regulate substrate concentration in cardiac diseases? 
So we did not look at um, um, substrates in all the pathological conditions that we have tested so far. We have characterized quite well the uh, heart failure model and pressure overload model. So there we see that uh, blocking MAOA uh, upregulates the levels of uh, norepinephrine and prevents its degradation. Um, the same is true for dopamine if we block MAOB, but for other, um, that's what I can tell you. This is what we have looked at specifically. In other conditions, we, did not, we didn't look at that. Um, Rosanna Bassani, do you think that all changes in IPS differentiation after MAO knockout could be attributable to ROS generation? No, uh, so we do attribute them to ROS because uh, we can easily measure ROS, but as I mentioned, uh, there are also other, other products of MAO activity, for instance, aldehydes, and we know that also aldehydes could be, uh, are very reactive and can play a role in uh, mitochondrial and uh, cellular dysfunction. So I'm not sure if uh, aldehydes produced by MAO can also serve a signaling role. I cannot exclude it, uh, but it is possible, definitely. And also, we are not sure whether uh, by activating or inhibiting MAO, whether different levels of substrates that we have in the iPS cells, because uh, it clear, MAO in iPS cells is clearly active, because if we delete it, we have a huge drop in ROS formation. So it's clearly metabolizing something. Whether those substrates can also play a role in cardiomyocyte differentiation, uh, I don't know, but it's possible. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce this. Shanmu uh, Gasundaram. Sorry. <laughs> That's a good attempt. <laughs> we apologize for mispronouncing it. <laughs> um, did you try treating MAO line with any ROS agent? Um, I'm not sure I understand. So if. Uh, Maybe they mean antioxidant. I don't know. Is that what they mean by ROS agent? Perhaps antioxidants or. So, giving them an oxidant. We did uh, use antioxidants, uh, for instance, in the IPS model, so, uh, but not in MAOA, not deleted ones, but rather in the wild types, just so that if we delete, I mean, if we scavenge all the ROS, uh, this is also bad for differentiation, which is the case. I didn't show it, but uh, if we delete completely, I'm sorry, delete. If we scavenge ROS indiscriminately, um, cardiomyocytes do not differentiate. So it's even worse than just uh, deleting MAOA. Um, that's what we did, but uh, no, we didn't. Maybe, maybe you think so maybe with hydrogen peroxide, peroxide or something like that. Ah, yes. So that's, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, we did not did, do it extensively. So in the um, uh, cells that are lacking MAOA, if we give a pulse, but this was really like a, a bit of a random experiment. So if we give hydrogen peroxide, we gave one micromolar, we do see that uh, phosphorylation of AKT is restored. So this is the only thing that we do, we did, but I don't know whether then that leads to proper cardiomyocyte differentiation. We didn't go that far. Uh, Beverly uh, Rotermel, is there feedback, feedback regulation in which mitochondrial function impacts MAO activity? That's a very nice hypothesis, and I do not have an answer to this question. But uh, yes, sometimes uh, uh, we do have a hypothesis which is still untested, so I don't have proof to say that, but we do think that... Um, possibly some of the MAO substrates could be stored within the mitochondria so that when PTP opens, which happens when mitochondria are dysfunctional, uh, that would actually um, uh, release the substrates that would then be degraded by MAO. So this is one of the hypotheses that we have, but I do not have evidence to support that. So it's only a hypothesis, but uh, yes, thank you. It's a very nice idea. Uh, could you repeat the type of construct introduced uh, into the MAO knockout IPS to restore the expression of the MAO protein in these cells? Uh, yes, this could be done, but we, so the, how the 
experiments were designed at the beginning, uh, we cannot reintroduce the uh, MAO plasmid into those CRISPR-Cas9 uh, MAO deleted cells. This is why we went for, um, for the siRNA and the transient um, uh, reduction of MAO activity. Uh, we should actually completely change the strategy that we used for knocking out the MAO and use a different um, plasmid to re-express the protein. Bruno Cabral, uh, did your group come to assess the levels of mitophagy in the streptozotocin induced type 1 diabetes model? No, we did not look at mitophagy. Um, no, we did not. Uh, we looked at uh, autophagy uh, and we did look at uh, mitochondrial dynamics um, in the doxorubicin model. We did see that mitochondria are more fragmented in that model uh, and we did see that the MAO inhibition restored. So it um, kind of shifted the distribution of uh, my smaller mitochondria towards the more bigger ones. But mitophagy was not, a, I mean we did not see an effect on mitophagy. Uh, by looking at the levels, levels of uh, mitochondrial proteins, this is the kind of analysis that we did. But in the DOXO model, not the streptozotocin one. Lucy Carrier, uh, in your last part, why does MAO knockout lower mesin heavy chain 6 but does not affect the 7? Uh, yes, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We repeated those experiments many times, and we do see a clear a down regulation of the six, but not the seven. Uh, and at the moment, I do not have an explanation for that. Do you see a compensation of the expression of MAOB? No, we don't. We looked at that, and uh, we do not see any upregulation, compensatory upregulation in MAOB when we delete MAOA. In your first part, you did show many positive effects as prevention. What about treatment of heart failure after TAC? You mean after, uh, after the cardiac damage is already uh, established, I guess, right? Uh, we never tried that, so I don't know whether there could be a reversal or uh, a delay in the... So we've never uh, in blocked MAO when the damage was already established in vivo. So I do not know, but that's an excellent suggestion, and it's definitely something that we should done, that we should do because it's uh, clinically relevant, of course. But I guess how many studies, you know, show a reversal? Of well, there are studies. Uh, yes, this is something that I have already thought about because sometimes I see that people do that, and actually it makes a lot of sense, obviously. So um, yeah. Rodolphe is just being kind, so thank you, Rodolphe. <laughs> I, I think that is a problem, by the way, of Phil refusing to ask questions <laughs> because <laughs> you can't always uh, give all the compliments to yourself. <laughs> so you're skipping a lot of the compliments intentionally. Yes. So yes. We're going to get you to, to read these out for her so that you <laughs> actually get some compliments as well. Uh, Rio Juni, uh, can you speculate at which level picomolar, nanomolar, ROS is beneficial, detrimental? Uh, no, I cannot. I wish I, I knew that, but no, uh, I don't feel like speculating. Uh, mm, no, I'm sorry. I think we need uh, better tools uh, that we can, so that we can actually measure and establish that. So uh, no, I'm not sure. Um, what but Phil, are. what are your thoughts on this? I mean, you yeah. must have thought about this a lot as well. Mm, it's very difficult to know. You know, um, for ROS signaling, um, you know, I, I think many people in that type of area would think that the peroxyredoxin proteins are the first guard against things like hydrogen peroxide, and we can consider their KM for substrates are probably in the 10 to 20 micromolar range. Um, you know, um, there's a concept that continues to emerge where these proteins have to first become oxidized and then pass on the signal. You know, it's very unlikely in many cases that oxidants directly target proteins, but instead these sensitive proteins pick up the signal and hand it on 
And so when you look at the characteristics of those proteins, you need micromolar, and you should consider that in many cell types, those proteins themselves are present at tens of micromolar concentration. So, you know, we, we, sh we shouldn't confuse that when we put tens or hundreds of micromolar on a cell, what we're doing there, you know, it may not, it doesn't, it's a model, um, you know, uh, only so much of it diffuses in, um, there's lots of defense mechanisms. So it's, it's very difficult, but it may be well above nano or picomolar, mm. you know, yeah. because, you know, this is, you know, two or three or four or six orders of magnitude below the concentration of the very proteins, which are the first ones that are going to defend against it. So yeah. the concentrations could be a lot higher, but you know. Okay, so would you ever then get an excess? You know, would you ever then be able to go over that protective threshold? I mean, it seems like a lot to me. Well, the enzymes are dependent ultimately on reducing equivalents made by, you know, NADPH um, principally. And, you know, you can consume, you may not be able to keep up, you know, you, you, the enzymes become oxidized and you have to be able to reduce them. Um, but, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. That's kind of what I was asking about, you know, thing, probes like Hyper might allow you to make some estimates, you know. Thanks, Phil. Um, the next question is by Luis Gonano. Uh, it has been shown that reduced intramitochondrial calcium levels increases mitoros production. How do you relate intramitochondrial levels with your results? Um, we have never looked, we never measured specifically mitochondrial calcium, uh, so we've looked at cytosolic levels. Uh, uh, the group by Jean Miele Perez, uh, Perez and Dino Parini uh, very recently did a very nice, elegant work showing that um, activation of MAO uh, induces peroxidation of, um, of the, um, sorry, no, the, I'm missing the word of the cardiolipin, sorry, the protein in the mitochondrial membrane, the uh, phospholipid of the mitochondrial membrane. So it induces the um, uh, lip, uh, peroxidation of cardio, cardiolipin, and this results in the formation of 4-hydroxynonenal in the mitochondria. So I think this is the first uh, demonstration of something like that. And uh, since the 4 hydroxynonenal is a, a very reactive aldehyde, so if it's not promptly um, uh, eliminated by LDH2, it binds and forms the ducts with different proteins. And they have found that uh, um, 4-HNE, uh, when MAOA is upregulated, binds to VDAC and to uh, MCU, and this uh, results in increased uh, mitochondrial calcium content and calcium, mitochondrial calcium overload in post-ischemic ischemic myocardium. So, yes, that's the something that, I mean, it's not done by us, but uh, it has been done by, by their group. It's a very nice work. Parhan Rizvi, uh, whether MAO associated with post-operative atrial fibrillation was measured preoperatively or after surgery. I think after surgery, because it was done on uh, samples of uh, atria, so I guess it could not have yeah. been done before. Yeah, taking appendages one day, so yeah. and then looking at them. Exactly. Uh, Julieta Palomek, which would be the mechanism for MAO-induced mitochondrial fragmentation? Uh, I'm not sure. I think that uh, simply uh, depolarization, uh, loss of mitochondrial membrane potential could trigger uh, fragmentation as uh, with the classical DRP1 mediated mechanism, but we have not looked at that. Uh, Laura Sommerfeld, uh, Sommerfeld sorry. Uh, does MAO inhibition or knockout cause any changes in heart rate in the mice? Yes, uh, I, if I remember correctly, uh, I think that heart rate was slightly reduced at baseline uh, oh. in the knockout mice. So, so do you think um, related to that, you know, you use this model with TAC, you know, uh, you, know you, you basically put a block in front of the heart, um, but this model in the real world when somebody's maybe suffering from something that leads to heart failure and you give this monoamine oxidase inhibitor, 
the blood pressure is going to rise, you know, and then you're going to give the heart a bigger load to work against and it's going to, you know, drive uh, the disease maybe, you know, you don't model it perhaps when you have, um, when, when, when you have this occlusion, you know, with the TAC, but if you give the inhibitor, high blood hypertension is a side product of the use of these compounds. That was the case with the earlier compounds. So uh, uh, what you are suggesting is that um, uh, blocking MAO and uh, also ingesting some food that uh, might contain biogenic amines, such as steroids. Yeah. Could but, cause but, why, but why wouldn't? Why do the modern? Why if you are the great? You know, if you're preventing the degradation of noradrenaline, why would you not get an increase? Does it just not spill over to the circulation? Is that? Is it, is it because it's, it's only interest? Mean, you are you know. right to, um, to, I mean, to say that, uh, but that was the case, this hypertensive crisis were the case with uh, uh, older generations of MAO inhibitors, which were irreversible, okay? So once the, uh, the inhibitor was bound to the enzyme, that was it. And until the enzyme was turned over, there would be no uh, MAO available for, um, for the, uh, degrading any substrates. The novel, you, the new generations of these inhibitors are selective, so for either one or the other isoform of MAO, and they are reversible. So in case there is a very high concentration of substrate, it would be um, displaced. Uh, okay. So the substrate would, dis would displace the inhibitor. Just because the decrease, the decrease in heart rate may reflect, you know, a response to the hypertension, which they're causing. But the decrease in heart rate is in the knockout mouse, not with the pharmacological inhibition. So okay. Okay. I, I always uh, do say this caveat about the knockout mice, which I really don't uh, like very much because it's a global and constitutive knockout. So it really has quite a lot of ad adaptive change already at baseline because of the large amount of catecholamines that are circulating. But with the pharmacological inhibition, so we used it up to, up to 12 weeks, and we never saw any changes in baseline uh, cardio, uh, uh, hemodynamics or in heart rate or anything. Sorry, okay. yes, I didn't specify it. So with pharmacological inhibition, no, but in the knockout mouse, yes. But, but Nina, is it, is it, I mean, I guess Phil is right. Is it surprising that, you know, you don't see changes in, let's say, heart rate, which would be particularly responsive to, um, you know, cyclic AMP levels. Um, the, you, is, that, is that a surprise or is that something you would not really worry about too much and you find it, you know, it's easy to explain? Yeah, uh, well, I guess, I mean, these inhibitors are being used in the clinic also in now, I mean, today, it's not something that has been abandoned, so... Um... Well, but th those inhibitors, presumably for people with some, you know, um, neuronal disorder where you're trying to um, stimulate them to be happy, maybe, it's probably a cyclic, you want to in increase cyclic AMP, you know, to give them, you know, the same as you would with many of these. T so that's why, but maybe in myocardium it's different, you know. I guess the question is, are PKA substrates increased in their phosphorylation status when you give the MAO inhibitors. Perhaps yeah. they're not uh, as a kind of easy readout for um, what's happening in the myocyte. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe they're not. It's well, I mean, that could be easily tested, actually, yes. We've never looked at that, but uh, certainly it's something that we could do. And uh, as um, somebody suggested before, checking at uh, patients that have been receiving MAO inhibitors to see how do they behave hemodynamically and uh, what is the status of their hearts would actually be informative also in that sense. I mean, I'm still I'm amazed. You know, I, I remember we spoke about this what, last year, and I'm still amazed that no one's actually looked at this. You know, surely this data should be available um, in a clinical setting, and, and it is, I'm sure. It is, it is available for sure, yes. We just need to look at that. Uh, Kaya Shamim uh, is if my MAO levels are age and gender dependent, and if so, uh, age or gender increases vulnerability. Uh, age dependent, yes. Uh, so, MAO expression and activity increases with age. So, uh, that's something. Uh, gender, uh, I don't think so. No, it's, uh, I don't, it's 
from the top of my mind, uh, I don't remember uh, reading that there are differences between uh, male and female, no. And uh, yes, vulnerability, so with aging, yes, uh, age, obviously aging hearts are more susceptible to damage, that's uh, obvious, but it appears to be also, this again has been done by Dino Farini's group, uh, uh, they checked uh, MAO expression in the red heart with aging and showed that uh, it increases uh, ROS formation activity and expression, yes. And Lucy Carrier is sending a compliment, thank you Lucy. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to echo that. I think we've come to the end of the questions and uh, I think Nina did a great job and there were lots of uh, thank yous and fantastic talks mentioned in the, in, in the comments. So uh, thank you for everybody, from everybody. Um, what should I do? Pass you over to you, Davo? Is... Well, I, I, I'd just like to thank Nina again for, for a really, really great talk and a great, great discussion and lots of questions, clearly. Yes. It's an interesting topic. People are interested. Thank and, you for the discussion. It was a pleasure of being here and thank you for having me. No, and, and Phil, thank, thank you again. Um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for your insight. It really is helpful because this is not my area for sure. So, and, and see everyone tomorrow, hopefully, and um, let's see who's actually been watching us the most. You'll find out tomorrow. Bye now. See you all tomorrow. Bye. -bye. Bye.